Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, at Wayne State University. It is November 15, uh, 2013, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another version of Meet the Methodologist. And we're very excited to have a two for today, as we have joining us uh, on the far right, Mike Zicker from Bowling Green State University, and in the middle, Scott Tony Dandel from Davidson College. And as you probably figured out, uh, they're here to do a webcast lectures uh, later on this afternoon. But we're going to take this opportunity to chat and get some of their perspectives on uh, research and careers and philosophy and music and whatever else they might want to share about. So uh, welcome to Karma. Good to have you here. Thanks for having Thanks. us, Larry. So uh, I like to start out just, I'm always interested in how people end up getting involved in uh, the profession and in spite of us doing a lot of the same things, many of us come from different backgrounds and starting out with different interests. So what was it that got you guys interested in psychology and the respective directions that you took? Um, I. I was an undecided major up until the last minute that University of Illinois made you choose a major. So it was like second semester, sophomore year, and uh, I just liked psychology. And uh, those were the classes that uh, I liked, and I was really scared. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I knew I had to go to graduate school, and I, my grades were just okay. Um, but I, I went with what I was passionate about, and um, it turned out perfect. Um, I chose I.O. Um, one, I was scared of working with uh, people with uh, clinical problems because I felt like, you know, how could I solve anybody's problems when I was a confused undergrad myself. And, uh, I, but I really liked the stats and math part of psychology, but I didn't want to go into quantitative psychology because I didn't want to be dealing with X and Y all the time. And so I.O. psychology was just a great fit for me. Um, and I ended up staying at University of Illinois for graduate school working with uh, Fritz Draskow. So I, it was really a perfect fit for me. And I, you know, I, I look back, I just feel like I kind of stumbled into uh, the right, you know, the right path for me. And if one little thing would have gone wrong, you know, differently, I could have been a high school English teacher or an accountant. You know, who knows what I would have been doing. So. How about you, Scott? Well, I think stumbling into it sort of describes my path as well. Um, I remember I took a social psychology class as an undergrad and really enjoyed that class a lot. And then another area that I took a bunch of classes in as an undergrad was economics. And I sort of saw I.O. as sort of blending of those two interests that I had. And I also got some uh, sage advice from actually my older brother's roommate. Uh, my older brother also went to Davidson. That's where I did my undergrad. And his roommate said, you know, you should really think about psychology because I know you're good at math and that's a skill that's really valued in that field. And so I think um, my quantitative skills in addition to my interest in social and my interest in economics sort of led me down this path to IO psychology. I just want to say it frustrates me. I'm a department chair at BGSU and uh, I see a lot of people get into psychology and they hate math. You know, and it really, it really kind of bums me out because I... I, I just see that as such an important part of the field that, you know, when, when we have undergrads take statistics classes and they, they treat this as if they're like it's as difficult as climbing, you know, the Himalayan mountains or something like that, you know, and it, it just kind of kind of bumps me out because I just see it as such an important kind of fun part of the field, but that's just maybe why we're here and they're not. So. <laughs> there you go. Well, so uh, you got into graduate school, you may not have started graduate school uh, thinking you were going to end up being a, a quantitative person or a methodologist. So uh, was there a particular course in graduate school during which it's like, yeah, this is what I want to do? Uh, was there a particular faculty member that kind of turned the light on for you? So how did, how did you get kind of into that particular niche part of it? Why don't you yeah, start? Sure. Um, so I think there are actually two events for me. Uh, one of them was I did really well in the quantitative courses my first year. We had an ANOVA class and a regression class. And I did really well in those classes. And the individual who taught those courses said, 
you know, you're doing well in these courses, there's a guy over in the medical school who runs a psychometric lab over there, and you should go meet with him. And I ended up meeting with him and really worked with him uh, throughout the rest of my graduate career, learning how to do uh, Monte Carlo simulations and quantitative research. And so that was a big turning point for me. And uh, Larry actually already knows this. Another big event that I had was I actually attended the first ever Karma Mini Conference uh, my second year of graduate school. So it's an opportunity to come to Karma, and I met with a bunch of um, sort of eminent methodologists in our field. It was sort of this very small community, and I sort of thought, oh, well, that's actually something that I could get interested in. Here you are now. I know. How about that? <laughs> um, for me, I, I'm really pretty strange in that. I mean, I was really interested in measurement as an undergrad. I think at, at Illinois, they had a pretty strong undergraduate uh, research track, and so I was very interested in that. And then um, just some things in graduate school, so studying with Fritz Traskow was great. And I also had this really neat opportunity that Fritz, so it's, it's very incestuous, it sounds like. I mean, it's like University of Illinois, University of Illinois, University of Illinois. It's a good thing I, I left there. But Fritz's advisor, Fritz got his PhD at, at University of Illinois, and his advisor was a guy, a very obscure name, Michael Levine, who was in Ed Psych. Um, and is a true was a true mathematical psychologist. He's passed away since then, and and he has to have been. If you think of like a mathematical ability of psychologists, I mean, he he had to be like a z-score of six or something like. There are only a couple people who were were probably as good or better than him, and to the point where, you know, I, I couldn't understand most of what he was saying, but I really picked up this passion for him of really pushing myself at a deeper level of trying to understand you know the uh, the assumptions and the mathematics behind statistics and so even though I wasn't anywhere near where he was at I just had these really great moments where you know you, you just see the passion in other people's eyes for things and that passion just rubbed off on me so, yeah. so um, obviously you both are very successful now and like probably most people, where they're, whether they're succeeding or failing, they sometimes reflect and say, well, what is it about how I do things that makes me successful or, or unsuccessful? Let's focus on the successful side, since you're successful. <laughs> you can focus and, on both. And, 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 and the, well, we'll limit ourselves to the successful part for now. And uh, the question is, do you, can you look back to any part of your graduate training where, whether it was a course or a faculty member, where you picked up something that you think really has helped you have the success uh, that you're currently having? I mean, I think you make, make mention of pick, seeing the passion and picking up the passion. Was there something else, or how about for you, Scott? Uh, well, I think one thing that has really helped me out, um, the chair of my dissertation was Mickey Quinones, and he had this fantastic skill of taking an idea that probably wasn't a great idea, but I thought it was, and being able to turn it into something that sounded amazing. Um, so he was able to take this thing and make it into this story that you wanted to tell and people wanted to read. And it really helped me figure out how can I take these ideas that I have and make them publishable. Because it's one thing to have a good idea, it's another thing to sell that good idea to people and make them want to read it. And I think that's been a, a big influence on me in terms of getting publications, which is a big part of being successful in this field. So, Indeed. Yeah. Mike, something beyond uh, picking up the passion? I think it was just a, it was kind of this real freedom to do what you want, and, and maybe, I mean, it, it's almost like stealing Scott's idea, but I, I really liked, and I, I've always enjoyed sort of researching whatever the heck I want, regardless of whether it's popular or not, and, and I felt like I got a real green light to do that in graduate school, and to, you know, to take ideas that were maybe a little bit weird and have, have a, have your advisor sort of craft that into something that could be uh, more presentable in a in a journal or in a mainstream outlook, and so I, I liked that that freedom to just do whatever you want. Don't you know? There's something to be said about having a really narrow, rigid, uh, programmatic research uh, path, um, but in the long run, it's a little bit fun to to also um, have different 
you know, a lot of freedom to do whatever you want to. Yeah. Well, one of the things, uh, in addition to the faculty that we work with as students, uh, one of the other things that has uh, a great influence on us are are the books and articles that we encounter in our coursework. And of course, some of those we manage to keep with us uh, uh, for many years as we move to place and place. And, and some of those we rely on uh, regularly even in the work that we currently do. So is there any uh, do you have kind of like a classic go-to that you that you rely upon or that you highly recommend uh, to people as they're getting started in their respective areas of study? I, I think there's so many bad <laughs> statistics books out there that, that like... Well, we want to try to stay on the positive. I know, I know. I, I am, so I, negative. I, no, 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 no. But like, so... I, it, sometimes it just motivates me to really want to write my own textbook. I, I think one of my favorite stats books is uh, Phil Bobko's uh, that correlation and regression analysis book, and and I it, I turn to it all the time. It's it's entertaining but not annoying, and it's so helpful. And he lays things out just so clearly. Um, and I, I teach or occasionally teach a regression class to first year graduate students and I, I don't use that book because it's so targeted to IO students and the, the class is geared towards everybody but I, I really recommend that book for people who are struggling and I, 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 I just think that's like a really really good book that lays things out clearly but also gives you the complexity of the things you're, you're talking about. Usually things are either dumbed down so much or they're so complicated that people miss the quote. So I, I hadn't really thought of the answer, but I think that Phil Bobko book yeah. is one of my favorites. Yeah, that was definitely one that I was going to mention. Um, I think a couple other ones, I think Guyon's book on selection um, just has a lot of really good information in there. Um, that's one of my favorites from graduate school. And then I love pretty much all the books by David Howell. So he writes a bunch of textbooks, some at an uh, undergraduate introductory level, some for graduate students. And I just find the way that he talks about uh, statistics to be very accessible. So. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to, that you both mentioned the Bob Coe book. It's one that I use in the class that I teach. And uh, I was the editor of the series that, uh, that accepted it and published it. So and it really does have a very nice uh, style. We uh, want, writing I want Phil to write a more expanded book then, so uh, let's, <laughs> let's get him to see this video. There you go. <laughs> Just spontaneously <laughs> talking about the Bobco book. Well, you mentioned the many conferences. Uh, Bobco came uh, several times, and uh, we haven't been able to get it worked out to do a webcast, but he certainly has contributed a lot. So, well, we're talking about success, and part of what goes along with success is becoming involved in... Uh, the review process and at the stages of your careers that you're at you encounter a lot of papers uh, in various editor, associate editor, editorial role, editorial board member roles and uh, I'm just curious as to whether they're kind of like a common set of mistakes or shortcomings uh, that if we can can make people aware of those young scholars aware of those, they can increase their chances of success and speed up the process and narrow down the pipeline a bit. So what do you think? Um, I mean, I think there, there are lots of themes that I see throughout um, the reviewing process. I think one of them goes back to actually one of my comments about being able to tell your story. So a lot of times I think authors actually may have a good idea, but they just do a not as good enough job to convey that to the reviewers and you have to remember the context in which the reviewers are doing this you know there's this free pro bono work they're doing for the journals and they you know they're putting in a lot of effort to the review but they're you know they can't read your mind and you really need to lay it out there and promote this convincing case for them to why this needs to be published and I think that that's one of the areas that um, authors fail in a lot. Yeah. I, I was going to say the same thing. Kevin Murphy has a great, there's a, there's a really good book, I think it's Rhythms of Academic Life, where they have uh, people from IO and, and OB writing about sort of behind the scenes things. And I think Kevin's uh, article is on getting published. And, and he, he says the advice, number one advice is realize your reader doesn't care about your idea. You have to sell it to them. And I, mean, I, I think from uh, what really kind of saddens me sometimes as a reviewer is, you know, that 
a lot of times articles don't have fatal flaws. You know, they've done a really good job of like kind of cleaning up the methodology, at least in the written version, so that you know there aren't huge flaws. You know, but oftentimes the, the authors don't do a good job of telling you why this is important, why it's why, how it fits in with the existing body of research, and why the why we should care, why we should put some really precious journal space to this particular idea. So I get sad sometimes when I, you know, that's probably the number one reason I write, you know, saying this paper shouldn't get accepted is that, you know, they haven't done a good job convincing me that it's important. Yeah. yeah I think one of the things that, that happens is that authors just become so familiar with the work that it exists in their minds and the authors don't really appreciate all the things that's in their minds related to the paper that aren't in the words that are in the manuscript. Right. They, and so there's a bunch of dots that don't get connected. And the best way that, and that I think people can address that is by is doing something that it's the common advice, but there's always so you feel like, I just want to get the damn thing in, and that is having somebody that's not familiar with it read it. Yeah, and I, I just was having these funny anecdotes. I hope a, a lot of people in here go into academia, and one of the first things that you will do after about a semester on the job is you'll send an email or when you see your advisor you will thank them for many things that you didn't realize that they that they were doing for you and, and one of them is that it, it has to do with you know when you're writing your article you're thinking about how important it is you've been thinking about it for so long and and nobody else has and so you lose that ability to to kind of to sell it and I, I just think of like a, so when I'm working with a student on a thesis or dissertation project, they think about it nonstop. I think about it in that 45-minute meeting that we have about once a month or once every two weeks. And so, uh, so I remember meeting with my advisor, Fritz, who was a great advisor, you know, and we'd meet once every couple of weeks, and, and I'd be so excited, I'd be working on data analysis, I'd come into the next meeting and, and he'd say, okay, what are we doing now? And, you know, it's just you're so invested in the project, um, and nobody else is, and so you know you, you've got to keep that uh, keep that perspective. Yeah. One uh, one other piece of advice is be very responsive to the editor's letter and the reviewer's comments, because that can go a long way in terms of pushing you forward through that process. Um, a lot of times. Um, authors try and defend things that they did and argue, well, this is why we did it, and this, you know, and your tack should be, okay, we did what you said, you know, do what they say whenever you can. And there'll be a couple times where you might need to take a stand, but you want to do that in the rare instances. You want to be as responsive as you can to the editor and reviewers, and that'll help a lot. Well, as with the experience, in addition to uh, developing a perspective about the publishing process, you also develop a perspective uh, on the field uh, as one grows and is involved in the profession and it's kind of like you end up looking down from a little bit higher altitude, a little bit bigger perspective. And so my question is if, if you pause to do that, um, are there areas related to the application of quantitative or research methods techniques? Do you think there are areas where methodologists are doing a particularly good job of investigating these tools? And are there other areas where there's gaps and methodologists need to be, ought to be studying these things that they're not? Kind of like a commentary. <laughs> <looking at each laughs> other, right? um, well, so one area that I'm really interested in moving forward is what I'd probably loosely call data science. Um, you know, some people use term like big data or data analytics. And basically, I'm really interested in thinking about how we can apply some of these data scientific tools to the things that we do. Now, I'm sort of self-promoting here because I'm actually editing a book in the Sci of Frontier series on this very topic. Um, but I think that's an area where we really need to start to think outside the box and start thinking about, you know, data mining tools that exist that we don't really use um, that actually might be something that, you know, I think there's a resistance against the word like data mining, but I think there's some potentially really useful applications for the field of I.O. to consider. Um, you know, I think it sort of changes the equation when you start thinking about statistical significance testing and having large copious amounts of data. And I think we've 
done sort of a poor job of thinking about Bayesian techniques and applying them to our field. Now, we see a little bit of change with like a special issue of journal management coming out and things like that. Um, but those are a couple ones that come readily, readily in mind for me. Uh, and I, I don't just pick a fight with Scott. I think uh -huh. what we want to, uh, I, I think one of the real keys with what we do is really wedding theory to our data analysis. And so I, I, I just get ex scared by the, the whole data mining and, and the focus on big data. But I, I, I'm excited and open to all those things. I, I just think, like, w as an IO psychologist, we're really in a pretty interesting and really exciting place to be a methodologist. And I, I think of, like, the research I do is on a continuum where we have really applied psychometric work that's really uh, there's nothing new in the psychometrics there. It's really just taking that some of the tools that have been developed by other people and using them to, you know, solve some practical selection problem or assessment problem. And then there's really basic research on, uh, you know, uh, new estimation techniques or, or in the middle, uh, Monte Carlo work to figure out, you know, what's the sample size needed to to recover parameters uh, accurately. And I, I just think um, IO psychologists, we're given the flexibility to really place ourselves in different parts of that continuum. And, and I, I, I think good methodologists really span that range a little bit so that they're comfortable reading journals like Applied Psychological Measurement, which uh, weirdly enough is not really applied at all. <laughs> um, uh, 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 looking to see what's happening in psychological methods and psychometric uh, but then also taking those techniques and translating them into things that uh, that are really important. And so I, I, I'm making you know making fun of data mining, but I think it's really important that we do pay attention to what's happening in in other fields and statistics and, and others, and, and really try to figure out what uh, you know what we can use in our field. Well, since uh, the topic has been brought up, first of all. Uh, you know, we do Karma Short courses, and so we're very excited to be offering three of them uh, next year. And Scott is one of our uh, new instructors, and he will be doing a short course on an introduction to R. And then there is a follow-up course to that by uh, Jeff Stanton that involves R and data mining. So if you're interested in data mining, we got a great sequence for you. Now, Mike, I really like your comment because as you were making your, your plug for data mining, I'm like, well, go, data mining, that's kind of like the opposite of having a hypothesis, you know, and where's theory in that, which was what you picked up on. So is that kind of a, a misconception? I mean, there's got to be some interplay between large data tools and advancing theory, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it has to be atheoretical. I mean, it's more thinking about these advanced regression techniques that you can apply in different areas to answer questions that you might care about. And it wouldn't involve, you know, certainly not confirming hypotheses that you maybe generate out of this data set. You know, we talk about, you know, you run a number of short courses on grounded theory, right? Mm -hmm. Which is trying to take a bunch of data and come up with a theory about it and then hopefully use that theory to test it later. Well, in some ways, it, you know, you could think about a similar approach, just a more quantitative approach of taking some data, building a theory about that, and then testing it. Well, I think that's great because we also have a grounded theory <laughs> course, so you can take the intro to R and then go into court grounded theory. This is really spontaneous. This wasn't canned or planned last night over dinner. Uh, okay, well, so as I mentioned at the beginning, you guys are here to do a webcast, so just to tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about in your webcast. Um, I, I'm going to talk for, I don't know how long, uh, 40 minutes to an hour on, um, on using IRT to really model some different complex, um, complex item structures and how to, how to use, you know, the one thing that's always excited me about item response theory is it's, you know, it's just this kind of black box statistical tool, but being able to use um, some of the logic like uh, SEM where you're you're uh, modifying your model to really try to understand what's going on in the minds of people who are filling out our self-report surveys. So I'll talk, that's what I'm going to talk about. 
Uh, I'm going to be talking about relative importance analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a brief introduction to that. But what I'd really like to do is spend most of my time talking about uh, some of the work that we've been doing, sort of extending those techniques to a variety of new areas. And then I also want to talk about a new resource that will hopefully let you do all of these analyses very, very easily. So check it out. All right. Uh, so the last comment is, uh, you know, I've talked with with a few people recently who talk about this phenomena of the importance of taking a break, and how oftentimes when they take a break and they let their mind do other things, when they come back, they have a different perspective on the particular uh, intellectual research process that they're working on. So was there anything that you guys like to do on your break that, that you, it gives you particular inspiration or motivation so that after it's done, you're ready to jump in and do more and do it better? Are you talking like a five minute break or, <laughs> or a but, five month break? But, I, guess. No, I'm talking I think both about of them are of value. <laughs> no, I'm talking about something that occurs kind of more regularly, like maybe it's uh, uh, sitting down for back to back to back to back law and orders or modern family. I mean, I don't know what it is. People have different things. I, I guess I, I'm, I've always been an avid reader. When I was in graduate school, my first semester, I didn't do any pleasure reading. At the end of the first semester, I, I just realized I was, I hated it. So I decided uh, my second semester onward, I was always going to have some pleasure reading going on. Whether I, and if it forced me to drop out of the program, so be it. And uh, and I always do that. So I I try to read something that's you know unrelated to anything in the field, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And uh, and I, I just I love it. Gives me a break, and sometimes it gives me a good idea too. So I I, I just always like that. How about you, Scott? Um, I mean, I'm going to talk about a break a little bit differently where you actually step away from your work and can still actually do it. Um, that's what I call the curse of academia because you can, you can do your academic job like no matter where you're at, right? You can be thinking about your next research idea or how to talk about your story or how to analyze this data and so on. And, you know, one of the things that's so frustrating for me is when I'm trying to do some data simulation and I'm programming it and you just hit this wall, right? You just can't figure out, like, why isn't this working? You get this error message. It doesn't mean anything to you. And I find it so helpful to just, like, step away, you know? And you step away and it could be, like, taking a shower or going to play basketball, driving around in the car and I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, oh, let me try that. And that's oftentimes how I figure it out is when I'm not actually sitting in front of a computer trying to figure it out. So... And then it pops in. Yeah. And that, that, that is such a tangible frustration moment. I mean, like, I, we've all been there, like, throwing crap against the wall, screaming, yelling. And it's some misplaced semicolon or something like that. But then when you figure it out. Oh, my gosh. That feels, like, so, so satisfying. Well, we, uh, we uh, know how busy you are with your respective schedules, and we appreciate you taking the time to come and contribute to the Karma Cause, uh, our third... A presenter of the year that got some exposure to karma as a grad student and uh, it's great having you both here and I appreciate you taking the time to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching.